Okay, good. Um, I think it's a good way to start the lecture. So, gravitational mass is this one. So, you know, in, we just manipulate them and, you know, we, we can cancel them out. We, we do that all the time. So we are assuming that they're the same thing. But, you know, they, they come from different, um, they arrive from different things. So I had a, a few questions for you. Um, what is what is mechanics and what is classical mechanics? Because there's also quantum mechanics, right? So what what is the difference there? You mean like the mechanics study the macroscopic um, objects? Macroscopic? And their motion. And their motion? Yeah. What about quantum mechanics? So kind of the same thing, like movement, but of smaller particles? Yeah. 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 Uh, I will agree with that. Um, so if you find this symbol, h bar, in your equation, then it is quantum, or at least semi-classical. Semi um, if you find Boltzmann's constant, then probably has to do with thermal. And if you find G, that G, then you're probably dealing with um, general relativity or some sort of gravitation. So, you know, like over here with, let's say, statistical mechanics, is it classical or quantum? So you can, you, know, you definitely have statistical mechanics of more macroscopic um, objects. Um, but like, if you really go to, if you really go to the foundations, you have fermions and bosons, right? You have different statistics, and that is that is quantum mechanics. So in the limit of like dilute solutions or like not super cold things. You uh, approach the classical limit, but you know, thermo uh, foundationally is quantum. What about gravity? Like general relativity. Is it classical or quantum? Classical. Classical. So you know, really the difference between classical and quantum is that in classical you have a continuum, and in quantum you have discrete quantities. What is interesting is that you know, general relativity is extremely accurate, right? Like for uh, for large masses or I guess uh, large densities. Uh, you know, the Nobel Prize last time was twenty twenty went to like Roger Penrose, and um, I guess the uh, observationalist who. Um, got the black hole at the center of the galaxy. 
right? And like general relativity is like, you know, super, super accurate. Same thing for quantum mechanics. You know, if you look at small things, quantum mechanics doesn't fail. So can we combine them? Do we need to combine them at some point? Some extreme cases, right? So, you know, in, in the, I guess in the, the lives that we live, we don't really need to combine them. Uh, we use classical mechanics for things that are big and quantum mechanics for things that are small. If you go to um, a black hole, then, you know, you have, which can be extremely cold because gravity is so strong, uh, you have both effects. And so quantum gravity, you know, is like, one of the frontiers uh, of, of uh, physics right now. If you have uh, two theories that are extremely accurate uh, in these in these uh, regimes, and then you have to combine them and they're incompatible, well, it tells you that there's something else that we don't know that, that is exciting. Um, all right, so. Um, you know, sometimes I hear that you know, classical mechanics is like done, that everything has been investigated. Is that true? Seems like it sometimes. Seems like it? <laughs> There's so much. Yeah. It's, and there's so many people, it's hard to like, you know, with all those searching algorithms, it's hard to imagine something that they missed. There's, yeah, you're right. I mean, everybody, every physicist uses classical mechanics or classical physics. Um, I guess it's kind of how we understand the world. So, you know, most like first theories are going to be classical, and you start to, you know, put H bars in there. Um, is there like research at the frontiers of classical mechanics? Is there a frontier? Yes. <laughs> Maybe uh, like uh, making like a uh, rocket ship again, maybe? <sighs> no? Boring. Boring? <laughs> so maybe there are, uh, they haven't found some exact solution for such a problem? Exact solutions? Yeah. Are there exact solutions to every problem? Well, we don't know, but well, there are... We know that there are problems that do not have exact solutions. No. Okay, so that's why, that's why I wanted to go into chaos, which is this part that yeah, is like, still... Yeah, uh, that made me think about like turbulence, for example. Is that turbulence, yes, for example, right? So people want to... Yeah, so that is classical. Um, it's unsolved. Um, I guess you have the... How do you call these equations? Well, there's, there are like the generalized momentum for the fluid. Um, yes, you know, like um, even for things like the solar system, right, we can predict, if you include all the effects that we're aware of, including um, general relativity, you know, the, for the sun and for Jupiter, um, if you include all of these, into like very nice simulations, you can simulate about 200 million years, right, before the um, inaccuracies and you know, just the, the inherent you know, three-body problem, four-body problem, uh, um, I don't wanna call them errors. Thingies, right, that accumulate. Because they're not, they're not errors. Uh, like this is, actually, this is real physics. Um, they accumulate and then you cannot really predict what's going on. So, you know, big things like the sun becoming a, a red giant, yeah, pretty predictable. Um, whether, you know, the Earth is gonna be kicked out of the solar system before that happens, we don't know. You know, maybe not in the next 200 million years, but there's a 
big chunk of time that we cannot simulate. Okay, so um, I guess we should, uh, I'm gonna hurry up a little bit. But um, I wanted to ask about this one. Which one is more general? Why? And I guess by general I mean you know more abstract and the third one is to find the gravitational force right between two bodies mm -hmm. and the second one is just force yeah. So, what are the you know, the main ideas of classical mechanics? I mean, quantum, you can tell me uh, things are discrete, but actually, this is not just classical mechanics. What are the what are the, the big ideas, the more fundamental thing you can think about in physics about so about the universe? Symmetries are, I will say symmetries and entropy, which are very mathematical things, um, are the two more fundamental things uh, in the universe. So this one, uh, it's an empirical um, law. People just, people find this if they had a lot of data. Um, Newton didn't have a lot of data and be able to figure it out. That's why you know, he gets a lot of recognition. But if he had not figured out you know, the time, it would have been figured out eventually, pretty soon. Um, this one, for him, was also by observation. Um, but this is not empirical, this is um, fundamental. Well, at least more fundamental. So um, what a symmetry gives you, I guess, uh, Arturo, can you give me an example of a symmetry? Um, I guess like vantage position. <laughs> vantage? Yeah. That means uh -huh. like the laws of physics are the same in whichever point of space you are. OK. So um, spatial invariance. Yeah. OK. Yeah, definitely. So I'm here, the laws of physics are the same as over there. Mm -hmm. um, we have tested that on Earth. We have tested that of greater satellites. And we don't have any reason to believe that that is not the case you know, in other galaxies. Um, probably <laughs> in other baby universes. Um, I don't know if you can call them that way. Different Big Bangs or something. So. Um, you know, the other symmetries are rotations um, and time, right? So if you do an experiment right now and you repeat it in the future, the physics are going to be the same. So whenever you have a symmetry, and we'll see this, you know, in more detail um, later in the, in the term, every symmetry has a um, produces a, cons a conserved quantity. So what is the uh, conserved quantity produced by um, spatial invariance? Momentum. Okay, yeah. What about time invariance? Energy. Energy. And are there any other ones? Well, I would hope that there'd be a third one for rotation, but. <laughs> There's actually quite a bit. Um, like charge is also, I think it's like a gauge invariance. Um, and, well, I'm not gonna cover special re relativity, uh, but, yeah, maybe, well, we just don't have enough time. But the speed of light is also um, an invariant point. It's, it is conserved. 
Um, okay, so there are levels of theory. So you know, this one is more abstract than this one. So you know, you can say that this is a higher level of theory. And what the higher level of theories tell you is how the lower level theories have to behave. Okay, so um, well, I guess you can get this one with general relativity. But even uh, if you didn't have general relativity, you will be able to say, you know, these are the properties. This is what you can do. This is what you cannot do. For example, you know, get the value of, of g. Okay, so. Let's talk a little bit about conservation laws. And yeah, this part, I don't know, it makes me a little repetitive, but um, it's good to have also basic definitions. So you know, consider. Newton's second law, suppose, suppose I made, this is the derivative with respect to time of the momentum, and typically we'll write this as momentum vector dot, okay? Momentum is uh, mass times velocity. Velocity is a vector. Acceleration is the time derivative of the velocity, which is a vector. The velocity is the time derivative of the position vector. And this is true for a particle. Goldstein essentially says, uh, we know this. And I think we're going to go with that. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time thinking about the definition of momentum. Um, it's going to be just you know, what we have been using for a while now. Um, you know, also, I guess particle will be nice to be defined. So what is a particle? No volume at the point, and all the mass is concentrated at that point. So it has no um, no structure. No inst well, at least we can consider that it has no structure, right? Like you know, the Earth going around the Sun, or the Earth has some structure, but you know, it's pretty small compared to the Sun, so we can ignore it. Okay, so. We're going to see uh, Noether's theorem uh, later, but here we're just going to say if the force is equal to zero, then the derivative with respect to time of the momentum is zero. We can move the dt over here, but you know that still will be zero. Uh, we can integrate this part, and we're here going to have the constant. So it's going to be the momentum plus some constant equals zero. Um, you know, so this means that momentum is equal to a constant. If the force is zero. Um, you know, this is nice because this is Newton's first law. I don't know why this is just, just a part of the second law. Anyways, um, so it's a conservation theorem. Uh, 
for the linear momentum. I'm going to move out of the way. total force is zero, momentum is conserved. equation 1.3 in bulk steam and this is you know I think it's on page three or something so this is the conservation of law for momentum the force is zero so now let's go into to define the linear momentum I mean angular and you know again we're just writing what we know about it if you go to a book like Arnold or something I'm not going to get into more detail, but here the angular momentum is L vector and it's R cross P. And I hope you remember that. Um, so this is going to be defined. So R is the the vector from you know O, which would be um, about where this thing is rotating. So we also need that O. And the torque. So we had the definition of force before. So the torque is R cross the derivative with respect to time of mass times the velocity vector. And typically we will assume that the mass is constant. So we will assume that here. Um, this one. We take the derivative with respect to time of R cross P or MP and this is our U, this is our V. So this is R cross derivative with respect to time of MV plus mv cross derivative with respect to time of r. What is, um, what is the derivative with respect to time of r? What 
is a cross product of NB dot B. Why? Is it zero? Am I hearing things? Why is it zero? What's that? I'm not sure. I think it's cross product of two years of Um, yeah, I mean, we can take the, the geometric definition, right, of the cross product. So it's like A cross B equals uh, A B sine theta. I guess it would be the right, of the angle between A and B. And so we have the angle of velocity with tau is zero. Sine of zero is zero. So can forget about this one. Okay. So then the derivative of L um, with respect to time and derivative is going to be R cross derivative with respect to time of P. So um, plus n b cross b is the same as this one. So we know that it goes away with the derivative with respect to time of the angular momentum, which we also write as L vector dot is equal to the torque. So here the mm, I'm gonna put over here. This one is equation This one is equation 1.11. So, just like we did with before, if the torque is equal to zero, then the derivative with respect to time of the angular momentum is zero, that's the same thing. Um, this one we, we went over here is still zero. If we integrate, then we get L plus some constant equals zero. So L is constant. So these things, um, might be pretty obvious, but we were deriving them a little bit more formally. So if the total torque is zero, then the angular momentum, the momentum is conserved. This has some interesting consequences. It means that if you apply the torque, you are breaking some um, symmetry of nature. Okay, so let's look at the next one. A little bit more complicated. So, which one do you think the next one is? Energy.
So this one also comes from Morse equals MA. So I guess Newton was onto something, huh? We define the work. by an external force on a particle. As, what is the definition of what? Let's say between points one and two. From point one to point two of the force, which is a vector, and the displacement, and what is the operation there? Stop product. Okay. Good. Not that rusty. Um, if the mass is constant, then we can take we can take it out of the integral and we can take mass integral from one to two of the derivative, we get the acceleration, which is the derivative of the velocity with respect to time dot the um, displacement element, the infinitesimal element. The derivative, we know that the derivative um, of S with respect to time is the velocity. So um, <coughs> my students in digital mechanics, in the, the very first mechanics classes, people can get confused when I use S or X. What is the difference? One is the displacement, and the other is the friction. Yes. So they're just symbols, right? Um, so I don't tell them this because then they get confused. They're just symbols. Usually, um, S refers to a line, right? So it doesn't matter if it's straight or it's like uh, wiggly. Uh, you're just looking at you know, the dot product, so you just go along this line. So typically, S is a little bit more general than X, I guess, in that sense. But you know, for the most part, I think they're pretty interchangeable. Um, so um, this implies that the S is the velocity times the T. So, um, right. So I'm putting over here with the T. Okay, we do some math jujitsu. It's not very complicated. Um, the derivative with respect to time of B dot just the, the product rule, uh, this is going to be the derivative with respect to time of b squared, so this is uh, the product rule, just b dv dt plus b dv dt, just very same thing. So this is two times the velocity vector times the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. So from this we can get that. We move this two over here. 
one half of the uh, derivative with respect to time of d squared is to be dt dot d, which is this d over here. So we can rewrite this as m over 2 integral from point 1 to point 2 of the derivative uh, with respect to time of d square dt. Then we can get rid of the dt's. We have the integral and the derivative um, from point 1 to point 2. So this is here, um, m over 2 d squared evaluated from point 1 to point 2. I'm going to put circles so I don't get confused. Right, so this is uh, m over 2 d2 squared minus d1 squared. Now oh, what is this? Kinetic energy. Right. Like a change in kinetic energy, right? Yeah. Um, so the symbol that we're going to use is T for the kinetic energy. Okay, so that's one part of it. Um, so this will be T2 and T1. So what we get from this is that the work done by an external force on a particle that moves from point one to point two is T2, kinetic energy at the second point, minus the kinetic energy at the first point. at the more subtle part. is a function of the position. Is it a function of time? Well, you cannot integral is defined as the integral. This is uh, gothic C or whatever. Well, it's supposed to be a C, but I want it to be also the constant. And this is the path, right? So the line or the path that it takes. force, 
course, it's different at every, um, well, this is not necessar necessarily different, it's continuous. And then you move along this line, R. So this is equal to, uh, this is just dot product, fx dx plus fy dy. Here I mean the component of of the force on x in the x direction. Okay. So I'm gonna call this equation asterisk. So in general, the value, the result of this integral, is going to depend on the path that you take. Right? So you move from point one to point two, but you know maybe you can move this way or this way or maybe this way. And the value of the force field or the force field is going to be different in general, right? So if you take C or C prime or C double prime, this value is going to be different. What is required for this integral to be independent of the path? going to be the definition of the conservative. Um, the condition is that the force is equal to the gradient of the function. Okay, so in the book it just says that this is a well-known theorem and it is well-known, it doesn't even have a name. So the gradient of some function that is necessary and sufficient condition. That's the only thing that you need. I'm going to prove the first part that is necessary and then in a moment you're going to prove the second part that is sufficient. Um, so force is the gradient of some function f. So, f of x is the derivative, the partial derivative of small f with respect to x. Fy, similarly, partial derivative, uh, sorry, of f with respect to y. And same thing for z. Okay, so let the path C, um, which is in space D, we're going to do it for three dimensions. Um, from point one to point two. be given by this vector. X, which is a function of time um, in the i direction, plus j, which is a function of time in the j direction, plus z, which is a function of time in the k di direction. And this means that um, dr, which is a function of t, you just take the derivative of this. Yep. 
So we have this equation over here. Um, if we if we divide by dt each of these terms, and then we put it over here, then we're just multiplying times one. So we're not doing anything bad. But now we can say that this path is defined by the time. Okay? So this is from small a to small b. So here, uh, the time is between a and b. Okay? Um, we have this. So if we plug that in over here, we get um, one to two. So first is pace. This is good to uh, unentangle your brain. Put it in terms of the time, so it's going to be the partial derivative of f, x, which is f with respect to x, dx dt. So the same thing that we did over here. So then this one, you can just write it as the partial derivative of the x component of f with respect to time um, is like, we still have the partial derivative there, but kind of, kind of limit it, so I'm putting the x in there just to keep track of things. Um, y. This is just the integral from a to b of the derivative of this function, now it's a total derivative, with respect to time, then we have time. So now it looks like the other one. Here we can get rid of the dt's, we have the integral and we have the derivative, so this is um, f, which is a function of x, y, and z, which are the functions of time. So this is a functional evaluated from t equals a to t equals b. So I have one more minute. I'm going to put it So it's potential energy. Um, the negative, you know, makes the math pretty. Um, again, it can be arbitrary. So this is a definition of a conservative theory, if, if this holds.
So the, the change in potential is independent of the path. So then we have W. One and two equals, we have the negative in here. So minus D2 minus minus D1. So this is the one minus D2. Potential. We had derived this one for the kinetic energy, and it was um, T2 minus T1. So T2 minus T1 equals T1 minus T2. T1 plus D1 equals D2 plus D2. And this, this conservation of energy. So the theorem is if the particle, if the external force is conservative, then energy is conserved. Total energy. Not equal to potential. Nice, right? All right. I'll see you on Thursday.